<clears throat> okay, that's ready. Uh, is it? Okay. Right, I think I'm in. So I'll just um, share my screen and then get ready. Oh, I should have. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm ready uh, to get going. And thank you, everyone, for joining tonight. Uh, this is our 13th or 14th presentation about the War of Independence, uh, Ireland's centenary of independence. So this is the June 1921. And I, I wrote during the week on the anniversary of the opening of the Northern Irish government uh, parliament about the king's visit. So I, I have a little extract from that, but there's a lot actually happening this month. Um, so, you know, I want to give you the, in terms of diplomacy, but also the kind of the highlights, I guess, of the violence, which is a contradiction in terms of it. So the first six months, and we've talked about this all year, of 1921, um, really did highlight the increasingly vicious nature of the conflict um, on both sides. And actually that viciousness kind of ended up hastening the desire for peace among both sides. There were 17,000 IRA soldiers um, and about less than one third of them were full time combatants. So, you know, people that just joined in very, you know, haphazardly. Um, and of course, a force that size could not hope indefinitely to hold out against 17,000 strong police force, which was backed by about 50,000 troops uh, between the British Army and the auxiliary force, as well as the Black and Tans. So, um, and of course, the British Empire had unlimited military resources, you know. Now, the one thing that does start to change after 1921, January, February time was that the morale among Crown forces was very low and huge international damage is being done to the British reputation because of the Black and Tan atrocities like, you know, the burning of Cork City and this kind of the response to um, the homes of citizens and civilians. Uh, in terms of diplomacy and politics, then the bones of a peace deal had actually been on the table since about December of 1920. Uh, don't forget that was the year, you know, that de Valera had been in America, for instance. So there's a huge press, you know, following him around. Uh, ostensibly, Ireland is working as if it is already independent. He's calling himself the president of the Irish Republic. And so there actually is an offer of dominion status for the Irish state, um, which would and don't forget, this had already passed in the Government of Ireland Act of 1920. So Northern Ireland is operating as if this already exists. And in fact, it does exist as of June 1921. And so that offer is kind of still on the table. There are secret talks being carried out through intermediaries between Lloyd George and Arthur Griffith uh, in particular, because of course, De Valera is in America and Michael Collins is more or less on the run. So Griffith presents these terms to both Michael Collins and then later on the wider Dáil cabinet, everyone reacting favourably. So there was a truce sort of uh, hoped for in December of 1920, but Hammer Greenwood, who we've talked about before, he was the, the chief secretary in Ireland, very hard line guy. He threatened to resign if a ceasefire uh, was accepted before the IRA had surrendered their weapons. Um, he was confident, as he wrote to Lloyd George, that Shin, the Sinn Féin cause and organisation is breaking up. There is no need of hurry in a settlement. We can, in due course and in our own fair terms, settle this Irish question for good. Now, that is was that was in December of 1920. So because of his own intransigence, the two sides continued to butt heads for at least six more months, the bloodiest months of the entire conflict. The first half of 1921 saw over 1,000 deaths in this uh, war, twice as many as for the entire year of 1920. So despite some optimism that the British military were getting on top of the IRA, there was no lull in the violence right up as the summer of 1921 approaches. So on the third, on the third, oh, sorry, and there they are. Um, this is the British administration. So I just wanted to show you Andy Cope, because he's kind of going to be a major figure in these kind of secret talks that are going on. So um, on 
June in 1921, the IRA volunteers ambushed British troops at Kyle Bake um, in County Tipperary. The members of IRA Northern Tipperary Flying Column were led by Sean Gaynor. That's the kind of um, fuzzy picture here. They attacked a mixed group of about 25 uh, British soldiers, RIC policemen and black and tans who were travelling from Boris O'Kane to Clock Jordan. They killed four and injured 14. James Briggs, who was leading the patrol, which really consisted of men on bicycles, there was about 12 men on bicycles and there were 16 in a couple of vehicles, were travelling to go to the courthouse in Clock Jordan when they were ambushed. Uh, apparently, one of the soldiers was actually singing, I'm forever blowing bubbles, just as the ambush hit. Briggs was killed instantly and three other constables died the following day. Four more were seriously injured but recovered. Briggs had joined the RIC, the, the Royal Irish Constabulary, in 1920. He had served in the Great War with the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Scots Fusiliers and had actually won the Military Medal uh, in 1917 and the Distinguished Conduct Medal of Honour in October of 1918 for conspicuous gallantry. Um, you know, so that's kind of an important, uh, you know, shows you that some of the, particularly the RIC men, not always the auxiliaries, you know, but they, these had serious military experience behind them. Um, it, later on, it, for about a week between the 4th and the 14th of June, 800 British troops just basically swept through McCroom, burning and, and kind of this reprisals. And in response to that, in the middle of June, the 7th of June, in the middle of that week, the British government officially called off the policy of house burnings as an official reprisal. Then on the 7th of June too, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland appointed James Craig as the first Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. Um, other members of the new Northern government were also appointed on this day. And at the same time, two Republicans, Patrick Maher or Maher and Edmund Foley were hanged at Mountjoy Mount Prison after being found guilty of killing a policeman during an attempted rescue of an IRA prisoner. Uh, and they were found guilty by military tribunal. They had actually both been acquitted by civilian courts earlier. Patrick Maher was only 32 years of age. He was from Limerick and Foley was a native of Gaul Valley in County Limerick, who was only 23 at the time of his execution. They made a joint final statement hours before their deaths. Fight on, struggle on for the honour, glory and freedom of dear old Ireland. Our hearts go out to all our dear friends. Our souls go to God at seven o'clock in the morning and our bodies, when Ireland is free, shall go to Gaul Valley. Our blood shall not be shed in vain for Ireland and we have a strong presentiment going to our God that Ireland will soon be free. So, you know, these men are really not backing down even on the eve of their own execution. By June uh, this month, 22 of two dozen Republicans who were to die by official execution for their cause had already been put to death. And so far in the uh, fight, no black and tan had been hanged. Now, there was sufficient evidence to bring several of their auxiliaries to trial for murder. And one of them actually was tried twice for murder. The abduction of prosecution witnesses and all this meant that none of the accused on the auxiliary side had ever actually felt the hangman's noose. But between photojournalism, the attention of the world's press was now focused on the behaviour of the black and tans. Everyone called all of the forces the tans, you know, and complaints were very thick and fast from America and Australia. So um, a black and tan consta constable, William Mitchell, was actually charged for being an accessory in the robber murder of a, a magistrate, Robert Dixon, which had happened in February of 1921. The prime suspect and the man who probably did it without this, um, without Mitchell's help, they were partners on the force, but there really was no evidence that Mitchell had done it. Um, the prime suspect had committed suicide. So Mitchell's guilt was more or less taken as a fait accompli. There was no evidence of his guilt. Uh, he, you know, so there was very little known about this. He's one of the forgotten 10, they're called. Um, so a historian in Dublin, DJ Kelly, confirmed that actually William Mitchell, interestingly enough, was an Irishman, a Dubliner. He was born in the Montgomery district of North Dublin, which was Europe's largest red light district at the time and a very squalid, you know, slum area. He was the son of a South London born professional soldier whose his father was a veteran of the Boer War and a local Dublin Protestant girl. 
Mitchell followed his father's example and joined the army, serving the empire in India, and then at the trenches in the Western Front during World War I, where he was badly injured at the Somme. So in fact, in 1918, he was in the lead and out of the army uh, with, you know, found himself with a young pregnant wife to support and, of course, unemployed. So he w enrolled in this war in 1919 and in 1921, February, in a small Wicklow town, Robert Dixon, the magistrate, was killed during a robbery at his house. So the man who really probably did commit it and at the time was suspected was a temporary constable Arthur Hardy. He was based in that little village, Dunlavin, in the police barracks, but he committed suicide before he could be brought to trial. Uh, the Dixon family identified his corpse as, uh, you know, the intruder who had come in and shot the magistrate. And his fellow constable with this William Mitchell character fell under suspicion uh, of being an accomplice and was arrested. And don't forget, by this time in Ireland, martial law had been declared, the restoration of the um, Order in Ireland Act. So Mitchell was subjected to a court martial, which is basically trial without jury. Um, they really had no proof at all that he did it. So he and his Cork born civil lawyer faced an intimidating battery of high ranking military officers, each of them, of course, the King's Counsel. Uh, the trial lasted barely two days. No witnesses were called to speak in his defence. The British judge and advocate general announced a guilty verdict and there was no right of appeal against that. So he was sent to the scaffold on the 7th of June, protesting his innocence and leaving a 23 year old widow with a seven week old baby daughter to face destitution. He was buried in Mountjoy jail with 40 other common criminals and his conviction and execution you know, was kind of seen by the British as a sort of a PR win because they claimed, you know, like we're imposing discipline on our ranks. We're, we're not letting the soldiers get away with, you know, bad behavior. Um, so he was killed the same morning as those two Irish, uh, Patrick Maher and Edmund Foley, the two IRA boys. But he was the only black and tan, uh, you know, a Dublin born man to be killed during the war by the British administration. Um, why is this not moving? So Leonard French then on the 9th of June. So like these are coming. There's daily occurrences, you know, happening. This man was uh, captured and shot in the River Nor, dumped into the River Nor by the IRA in Kilkenny. His body was weighed down with chains and buried somewhere in the river. He was reported missing for several months and his body was never found until much later on. Uh, or actually, sorry, his body was never found. Now, now, Oscar Trainer, one of the problems that the IRA had was arms. And so the, the Thompson submachine gun or the Tommy gun had been partially funded, imagine the development of it, by the IRA. And so this could have changed the course of the war if the shipment of arms had come in on time, uh, but they didn't receive enough of them. But if they had had that weapon, if the IRA had had that weapon in the numbers that they had ordered it, it would really have done a number, you know, on morale. Um, so the next, oh yeah, this is the wedding, imagine, of, um, there's Ernie O'Malley. So Ernie was married to this woman who had nursed him. Uh, she was in uh, Clan na Gael, Bridget Malone, a member, sorry, of Common Amon, I mean, and she nursed him back to health when he had been shot. So Sean Hogan was his best man and Anya Malone were the bridesmaids. And you can see here, you know, she's wearing sort of the insignia like of common man with the the tara brooch and all of this um these two men were at the time of his wedding two of the most wanted men in ireland and you know he even has a gun there on his lap uh so this one um charmers this was a, a really interesting kind of case as well uh he was a private, an 18 year old, this man, George Duff Chalmers, he was a member of the second battalion of the British Army's Royal Scots based in County Clare. And he was killed in Drumbone. Uh, it's believed he was captured and executed by the IRA. Um, this man on the right, Commandant Seamus Hennessy oversaw his execution. His body remained hidden in a bog and clear for seven for 97 years, and he was finally kind of located, and they reburied him in Grange Gorman in 2018. So that's why you see this stone here. So they were able to kind of return uh, that body. One of the 
worst atrocities from the IRA point of view, and particularly one that garnered them a lot of negative press, was this man's death, 78-year-old Protestant clergyman John Finley. Uh, his home was raided near Bon Boy in County Cavan. The killing was discussed on the floor of the British House of Commons, and Hammer Greenwood, who we have just met a minute ago, the Chief Secretary, called it a diabolical outrage. He was, according to varying reports, either shot or bludgeoned to death, and then his house was burned. And to be honest, it's not clear what the motive for killing this man was. Um, it was sort of interpreted at the time that it was simply sectarian animosity. That, And, you know, you see that there, there were certainly reports in the press, although the numbers don't quite bear it out. But there seems to have been an escalation in certain parts of the country of like local Protestants being killed or burned by the IRA, even if they had nothing really to do with, you know, the, the soldiers or the tens. The local Catholic clergy in, in this town were also outraged and three priests, uh, Catholic priests, walked in his funeral cortege. So his killing and other, you know, sort of attacks on Protestants worried, in fact, Michael Collins and the general headquarters of the IRA, the propaganda specialists, because they indicated a change of attitude towards the perceived loyalist population. And of course, not every Protestant in the South, you know, was a loyalist. Uh, so, in fact, the general headquarters had refused a request from Liam Lynch in the South for permission, quote, if the enemy continued to execute our volunteers to shoot one local loyalist, a prominent Freemason officer should be the first to suffer. And the IRA refused to sanction that order. So, you know, local kind of tension is ratcheting up. And of course, these people often would have known each other. You know, don't forget that. So back in um, January or February, we talked about the man who was walking down the street in the stone, my own hometown. He was holding the hand of his son and he was shot. He was an RIC officer, shot at kind of close range. Um, this man now in June was James Kane. He was the, a Royal Irish Constabulary who was executed by the, by the IRA uh, for being a spy. They alleged he was a spy. He actually wasn't an actual cop he, he worked for the state he was a fisheries protection officer so you know kind of against uh, poaching and stuff but on the 16th of june it was alleged by the ira that he had given information to his ric colleagues about the eight men who were involved in the shooting dead of tobias o'sullivan uh, in january and i think i told you at the time in january wrong people had been accused of the murder you know so it was all a kind of a, a bit of a nightmare in january and now it's continuing into june uh, so sometime after the death in January, men from the 6th Battalion, the North Kerry Brigade, kidnapped Kane. They did so on instructions from the IRA General Headquarters and interrogated him. And they held him as a hostage for definitely several weeks. Um, he was finally executed on the 16th of June and his body was left by the side of the road with a note, convicted spy, let others beware, signed the IRA. So I've, I've put up his letter there, his final letter. Uh, he composed a letter to his family, which the uh, the pension kind of files, you know, were exposed or, or released. The letter was addressed to his children because his wife was also dead. And it's alleged that when his coffin was lowered into the ground, one of the kids shouted, Daddy, Daddy. So it begins, my dear children, I am condemned to die. I had the priest today, thank God. I give you all my blessing and pray God may protect you all. Pray for me and get some masses said for me. He went on to list the financial provisions that he had made for his family and the money that he owed to people locally. Clearly, his children were being left now as orphans because he requests that he be buried next to his loving wife, if possible, is a quote. He concluded, don't go to too much expense at the funeral and have no drink or public wake. I am told my body will be got near home. So the IRA have assured him like they won't you know, hide the body or disappear it. Uh, I got the greatest kindness from those in charge of these men. Goodbye now and God bless you and God bless Ireland. Pray for us constantly and give my love to all my friends and neighbours and thank them all for their kindness to me. So, you know, very intense letters coming from these uh, people. Now, this is um, Patrick Darcy. Patrick Darcy was a local school teacher. Um, he was also executed by the IRA. And again, there's kind of questions over his guilt. Um, 
the head of the IRA intelligence investigated the case in 1945, and to be honest, they reckoned that the IRA had shot the wrong man. So this was one of his, like, you know, it's a letter to his mother, pray for me, I leave everything to you. This is his last will and testament. So these men, you know, their wishes were recorded, but you can see the IRA are really tightening up on um, who, what they perceive to be, you know, spies or traitors. And so that the Tommy gun that I just showed you a minute ago was first used on the 16th of June, uh, the same day that this man was, was executed as a spy. Uh, Oscar Trainer, who I showed you in the picture, shot at a train that was carrying soldiers. Three were supposed to have been injured, but nobody was killed. Now, the two of these girls, and I, I haven't been able to find out which two are the two, but Catherine Mahan and Bessie O'Brien died of their wounds about 72 hours after a, a bomb went off when they were standing on the street. There, no one is really clear whether the girls were involved or not. They think they weren't. At the time, it was alleged that they had been shot or caught in crossfire, but they were injured in the bomb blast. A bomb was laid by the IRA at near Cable Street in Dublin. And uh, several soldiers and Dublin Metropolitan Police were killed, were injured. The two women were killed and a four year old boy. So um, here's the motor depot in Dublin was targeted too by the IRA, probably around the same time. I think it actually was the same event that injured the two girls. Um, and then the parliament in the north of Ireland opened. So on the 22nd of June, King George V addressed the first session of the Parliament of Northern Ireland, calling on all Irishmen to pause and to stretch out the hand of forbearance and conciliation, to forgive and forget, and join in making for the land they love a new era of peace, contentment and goodwill. Uh, you know, he had had a, the Buckingham Conference a couple of years earlier where he tried to get Redmond and Carson and Craig to come to some agreement. I think that happened in 1914 or 15 and, you know, to no avail. So the king had actually been quite interested for a long time in trying to achieve peace for Ireland, even before, you know, the big uh, the War of Independence itself kicked off. But trying to negotiate a, a peace between the home rulers, we'll say, and the, the Northern Irish um all three unionists who don't forget in 1912 you know had signed the solemn league and covenant on the same day that the that the parliament is opened and don't forget like the the secret talks are going on trying to get griffith and and de valera you know uh to come to the table in fact de valera was sort of an unknown quantity because he'd been in america for so long that in fact they thought michael collins might have been more uh you know more willing to speak to them uh De, de Valera was arrested by accident in Black, Black Rock on the same day that the Northern Ireland Parliament opened. Um, so Andy Cope, the man I showed you in that first photograph, who was, you know, up to his neck in negotiating with, he met Michael Collins a number of times, you know, realised, oh God, like if we've if we've arrested the leader, we're in trouble. And so he intervened and had de Valera released from prison almost immediately. But, you know, to think that they had de Valera in their clutches kind of thing and gave him up shows you how, to be honest, how willing the British were to negotiate. So here is more pictures like Belfast was absolutely done up to the nines. You know, for this, you can see the Union Jack everywhere, people literally hanging out of windows. And in fact, you know, the, the violence in the north continues for some time. So it's interesting, you know, we, we talked earlier on about the Belfast riots and the shipyard riots. Um, there are, you know, several hundred Catholics displaced and stuff, even as this parliament is being opened. And so, um, you know, they got a lot of attention. There's the Queen with him in Dublin or Belfast. There they are at the opening of the, uh, you know, of the parliament. But but two days later, uh, three soldiers from the 10th Royal Hussars and the railway guard were killed when the IRA derailed a troop train um, in Kilivay, just outside County Armagh, or Armagh on June 24th, so two days later. The train was transporting soldiers and horses, at least 50 of whom the horses died. They were coming back to Dublin, um, having taken part in the military escort for the royal visit. So five soldiers and a civilian train guard were killed. Some soldiers fired at civilians who were working like in surrounding fields and they killed one. It was said that the soldiers cried for their horses because they had some of them had been through the Great War together and the horses had survived the war. And so they rounded up local people to dig these mass pits in which the, the 40 or 50 houses, the horses, some reports say 80 horses 
uh, were, were killed and, and they buried the horses. Uh, there's another. So this is a bad picture. It's, it's taken from you can actually see a short. It's about a minute long video on YouTube uh, of that the aftermath of the bomb. So um, I think that's that is the end of the slideshow. But I want to tell you about um, the diplomacy and what was happening. Let me just expand my. I don't know why this won't expand. Mm. Okay, sorry. So um, I'm just going to stop the share. Good. <laughs> uh, so by 1921, certainly by that January, Lloyd George's government was, we only had two options. They had tried to recommend peace. Hammer Greenwood had really put the kibosh on that unless the IRA surrendered their arms, not dump surrender. And this, of course, becomes a refrain throughout Irish history. Um, so their, their two choices were fight the campaign as a real war, which they had been reluctant to do. You know, don't forget they sent over soldier, uh, police, auxiliaries. You know, they, they were reluctant to even call them an army. Um, and so they didn't really want to call it a real war. And they would have had to declare martial law across the entire 26 counties. They would have had to up the level of troops and adopt a policy of wholesale execution and internment. And in fact, there were plans in place to start that phase by the 14th of July. So, um, so you know, one option was up the violence and the other one was to try to get the, to get someone to the table for talks. So to be honest, like, did the will on the British side want to go to this draconian policy? We know that Neville McCready, who was by now the commander in chief of the forces in Ireland, he was against it. He said there are, of course, quote, one or two wild people about uh, who still hold the absurd idea that if you go on killing long enough, peace will ensue. I do not believe it for one moment, but I do believe that the more people are killed, the more difficult a final solution becomes. So the other option was this attempt at negotiations, which was favoured by most of the British, uh, you know, civil service, we'll call them in, in Dublin Castle, and particularly Andy Cope, who was an assistant undersecretary, who had been very disappointed by the failure in December of 1920 to reach an agreement. Uh, so we know, you know, by January, De Valera is back in Ireland. Um, and so they thought, the British thought that De Valera would be a more moderate force because, you know, Michael Collins was known to be the head of the IRA and to kind of be leading the guerrilla war efforts. So they didn't think that they would get Michael Collins to the table. So it seems that Andy Cope, who had been instructed by the government, was in contact with the separatists we now know the whole time. At least from July of 1920 onwards, even Lloyd George had put feelers out through different intermediaries, including um, a Conservative MP, George Cockrell, Irish businessman Patrick Moylet, who had both been in contact with Arthur Griffith. We know Martin Glynn here in Albany, the governor of New York, was kind of in and out. Of course, some members of the church, Mannix maybe from Australia. Uh, Griffith had indicated his willingness to compromise. He said that in return for a ceasefire, and if the Dáil, the parliament, was allowed to meet openly, an Irish Republic will not be mentioned. Now, don't forget, this is kind of this will come up again in the in the treaty talks, you know, where Griffith is willing to compromise on certain language that maybe other people wouldn't have been willing to compromise on. So that you know that's kind of important. Um, but because of this grave escalation of violence in that first six months there. Particularly, I will say, even, you know, back in November with the killing of the British Secret Service men through uh, Collins' squad and then the retaliation of Bloody Sunday, Lloyd George had begged at the time for, he asked Arthur Griffith, for God's sake, quote, keep your head and not break off the slender link that has been established. Tragic as events in Dublin are, they are of no importance. These men were soldiers and they took a soldier's risk. So, you know, for Britain to be willing to overlook that is kind of telling, I think. Uh, so although the thing is, though, he maintains his uncompromising position in public. And so, you know, there is, they, I mean, they go on to fight war for another seven months uh, after those killings in, in November. But he is looking to negotiate. Um, both sides accept that a deal at this point will probably include some form of dominion status for Ireland. Lloyd George was not prepared, really. Uh, to countenance giving the Irish state fiscal autonomy, for instance, or an independent armed force. So the talks are stalling, not really on political issues, but on how to end the violence, you know, before the negotiations could even happen. 
uh, Collins and Griffith offered a bilateral ceasefire if the Dáil was allowed to meet freely. Lloyd George set out for what the Irish thought were unacceptable conditions. Not only would the IRA have to cease, quote, murderous attacks on Crown forces, but all arms, explosives and uniforms in their possessions would have to be surrendered before the talks could even start. He wanted to exclude Sinn Féin members of Parliament, for instance, particularly Michael Collins and Richard Mulcahy, uh, who were senior IRA officers, don't forget, from negotiations. So Archbishop Clune made the final offer to the British government. Uh, this was that early truce that was you know, rejected of a truce, but with no surrender of IRA arms. Lloyd George was kind of tempted. He floated the meeting with his military and the police chiefs, McCready and Tudor, and of course, Hammer Greenwood, uh, who rejected the idea out of hand. So McCready, his views are hardening over the year and a half between, you know, of, of this war. And so he argued that terror could be broken if they would just extend the martial law. Now, there were cracks appearing on the Irish side. Um, the Galway County Council, Roger Sweetman from Wexford, and the vice president of the party, the, the priest, Father Flanagan, had called publicly by December of 20, 1924 an IRA ceasefire. And O'Flanagan, vice, he was, you know, deputy head of Sinn Féin of the party. He had uh, looted agreeing to partition, uh, although most of the party did not agree with that. So, you know, you have this six months of conflict, even though they are trying behind the scenes, certain people more willing to compromise, you know, than others uh, trying to compromise. But and so neither of the strategies bore fruit in the elections. I, I told you this last month to Southern Ireland, Sinn Féin won every single seat unopposed um, and obviously following abstention policies. So, you know, this was what led to partition because Northern Ireland would become uh, would open their own government. Um, now, the police and military casualties in Ireland continue to rise. Um, and at this point, with reinforcements to British uh, military or Crown forces, there's at least 80,000 police auxiliaries, black and tans, in Ireland by June of 1921. So the fact that they are being pushed and pushed, huge negative press for the British, not so much for the IRA, which is interesting considering, you know, this month in June, a lot of the atrocities were committed by them. You know, they are singling out kind of locals for uh, being murdered as, or being executed as spies and things. Lloyd George finally agreed in the end of June to drop the precondition of the surrender of arms before a negotiation could take place. And so that's what kind of led on July 11th to the declaration of a truce. But by the end of June, they sort of know that this is where they're headed. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk to you was some of the, because I think these are fascinating, the Irish government documents that they're sending each other. So uh, Eamon de Valera wrote to a Lord Justice O'Connor on the 4th of June. Um, and again, it will just tell you his mindset about the talks coming. He said, your letter, so he wrote on the 4th of June, your letter of June 2nd has been forwarded to me. If the sky fell, we could catch larks. And such is the hope of securing the end of the struggle with England through a prior agreement with the unionist minority. For my interview with Sir James Craig, remember they had one meeting in May when nowhere, I am convinced that nothing is to be gained by a further conference with him. This is at bottom an Irish-English question and its solution must be sought in the larger general play of English interests. Carson can envision it in that light and knows how to solve it. I do not think, however, a meeting with me would in any way affect his will in the matter. So, I mean, you know, Carson has been intransigent from the start. You know, they were kind of encouraged by uh, unionists in general. I mean, encouraged by Randolph Churchill back in the 1870s, you know, like or 1880s. Ulster says no and Ulster will fight and will be right. So de Valera is trying to sidestep the unionists. But of course, like that is, you know, I mean, I think it was no longer possible since 1912. It's definitely no longer possible by June when they have their own government in, in that state. So de Valera says, as regards meeting yourself and Mr. Cope, what would be the use? So de Valera is kind of on the fence. Then Michael Collins writes to George Gavin Duffy, and he uh, he's doing it on behalf, he says, of the finance department. This is the 18th of June. And some of this letter was redacted because it apparently dealt with uh, some spies 
and correspondence with spies. He said, I fully appreciate what you mean by your reference to the peace talk. It would be a great pity if well-meaning people queered the position by too much of this. There are always those who want to insist on shaking hands before the combat is over. And in my opinion, we are not so near the end yet that we can afford to start the handshaking. You refer to the Armagh result. It was good beyond expectations. And the Armagh result was that um, in that general election of the 24th of May, Michael Collins was elected in the Armagh constituency. But of course, you know, they're not taking their seats. Uh, uh, so he doesn't take his seat in what becomes a Stormont government. Then on the 24th of June, the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, uh, wrote to Eamon de Valera, Sir, the British government are deeply anxious that so far as they can assure it, now don't forget the government in Northern Ireland opened on the 22nd, uh, the, the King's appeal for reconciliation in Ireland shall not have been made in vain. Rather than allow yet another opportunity of settlement to be cast aside, they felt it incumbent upon them to make a final appeal in the spirit of the King's words for a conference between themselves, the British government, and the representatives of Southern and Northern Ireland. I write, therefore, to convey the following invitation to you as the chosen leader of the great majority of the Southern Ireland and to Sir James Craig, the Premier of Northern Ireland. One, that you should attend a conference here in London in company with Sir James Craig to explore the, to the utmost the possibility of a settlement. Two, that you should bring with you for the purpose any colleagues whom you may select. The government will, of course, give a safe conduct to all who may be chosen to participate in the conference. We make this invitation with a fervent desire to end the ruinous conflict which has for centuries divided Ireland and embittered the relations of the peoples of these two islands who ought to live in neighbourly harmony with each other and whose cooperation would mean so much not only to the empire but to humanity. We wish that no endeavour shall be lacking on our part to realise the King's prayer and we ask you to meet us as we will meet you in the spirit of conciliation for which His Majesty appealed. I am, sir, your obedient servant, David Lloyd George. Eamon de Valera responds on the 28th of June, four days later. Sir, I have received your letter. I am in consultation with such of the principal representatives of our nation as are available. Little dig there, maybe. <laughs> we most earnestly desire to help in bringing about a lasting peace between the people of these two islands, but see no avenue in which it can be reached if you deny Ireland's essential unity and set aside the principle of national self-determination. Before replying more fully to your letter, I am seeking a conference with certain representatives of the political minority in this country. Now, that kind of negates what he just said internally to his own guy, like there's no point meeting with Craig, we did it, nothing happened. Um, you know, and I suppose like this is really the crunch of the whole issue and, you know, coming up to the treaty debates in December, was England even in a position to allow the, the South, you know, ride over the North and their wishes? So it looks like Lloyd George was kind of intending for the three parties to come together. We know, you know, certainly by the talks in, in the fall of 1921, Carson and Craig are not at the table. And that's used against the, the Southern delegates because he, you know, he holds up the two envelopes and threat, this is terrible in immediate war or this is you've accepted the offer. And so, you know, you don't know how earnest, you know, David or Lloyd George's um, offer of this kind of three way talk was. And of course, we know, you know, Carson and Craig, um, they've, uh, you know, the, the government is working up there. It's open. They have a state. Carson was not a man for negotiating even before this. So, you know, maybe Devil Era was correct in his assessment sort of thing there, like that, look, you know, you're that you're denying the essential unity and, and we're not going to we can't meet under those conditions. But, you, you know, I don't know that he was ever going to be able to do any more. And then the last letter I want to read to you, um, I think is interesting. Robert Brennan, who was involved in, you know, the foreign offices and the publicity departments, we've, we've read a couple of his letters before. He writes to Marie O'Brien, who's the newly appointed press agent in Madrid on the 10th of June. He says, the situation here continues encouraging, as you will have learned from home newspapers. The spirit of the people in the face of diabolical aggression is wonderful. And there is every sign that this generation of Irish men and Irish women will never be beaten to their knees. We are determined and the determination grows every day that this fight is no longer going to be handed on to a future generation. 
The Irish government, in spite of all difficulties, continues to function and to do so efficiently, which, you know, was kind of true. Needless to say, this would not happen unless we had the allegiance of the entire people. The whole population, so to speak, is a, a conspiracy against any future do domination on the part of England. And then the last one, I'll just read a, a little extract of this because it was very interesting. They're struggling to get recognition and kind of an audience with the Pope, uh, for instance, in Rome or in Vatican City. And so George Gavin Duffy, who Michael Collins had earlier written to, wrote to Cardinal Gaspari on the 30th of June, 1921. And it, it was a long letter, you know, kind of, why don't I, I haven't had a meeting. We're trying so hard to get an audience. We were dismayed that you haven't kind of come out on the force of Ireland. He mentions the fact, to be honest, you know, that Ireland is a Catholic country and why are you not sort of helping us? I think there was a, a vague reference to, you know, Belgium in there in World War One. But I wanted to read these, um, the six points that he says that he wants to make the Pope aware of. So he says, the Irish nation is one of the most ancient in Christendom and the Irish race, one of the most faithful. Two, that in my capacity of envoy extraordinary of the government, established by the will of the Irish people, I have the great honour to be the authorised spokesman in Rome of the Irish nation, and thus ipso facto the spokesman of the Irish race beyond the seas, so closely bound to the mother country. Again, this little hint that like, okay, Ireland is small, but we have a massive diaspora, and Australia and America in particular are watching that the non-Catholic government of his Britannic Majesty is waging against Catholic Ireland an iniquitous war with the sole object of maintaining by force a regime which is unquestionably one of usurpation. That the government of usurpation, usurpation enjoys the most ample means through its authorised spokesman of communicating freely to the Holy Father its views concerning Irish affairs. So he's saying, you know, like, which is true, obviously, the British government had established diplomats working in Rome that they can have an audience with the Pope, but you're not accepting, you know, our side of the story. While the Irish nation does not share this precious privilege and consequently the perfect neutrality, which the Holy See is concerned to maintain, has become exposed to a real and obvious danger. That we have evidence pro proving that the English government has already pledged itself to give a free hand this summer to the sinister designs projected by its general staff with a view to a supreme effort to crush resistance by intensifying still further the terror now raging in Ireland. I may add that the peace proposals of these recent days are linked with that threat for tomorrow to be put into operation as soon as the negotiations fail. And that, you know, has been borne out that was true, uh, that they were ready to kind of go with Hammer Greenwood's suggestion on the 14th of July. Lastly, that all that is necessary to ensure permanent peace is goodwill on the part of England. The Irish Episcopate, with its characteristic clarity, has just expressed the conviction of the country in its unanimous declaration of the 21st of June, which proclaims that until coercion comes to an end and until the right of Ireland to form a government of its own choice is recognised, there is no prospect of peace reigning amongst us, nor of the reconciliation so ardently desired by the Holy Father being accomplished. So the Irish are kind of waging a war quite successfully, you could argue, diplomatically and propaganda wise. You know, the, the Irish world here in New York um, under John Devoy publishing huge stories. The, the General Headquarters Irish Bulletin is pumping out information. You know, there are kind of glitches in their system when they kill local Irish Protestants, for instance. Um, but they're not catching flack the way the British government is. And so even though the British government far outnumbers them and far out um, in terms of arms and stuff, you know, outperforms them, it is really England who are needing this uh, this negotiation and, and this um, ceasefire and not Ireland. So, um, you know, by the 11th of July, the Irish have somehow managed to change the British government's policy to ensure that there is a ceasefire without surrendering the arms and that there is a, a truce. And the truce isn't really broken, even though the initial talks with De Valera don't work, as we'll see, you know, next month. So does anyone have any questions or comments? And uh, we'll go from there. <laughs> Uh, Karen, or, oh, Jean, are you talking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, with the um, with the king and queen visiting in Northern Ireland, you know, and then seeing this train destroyed afterwards, would, 
Were they fearful? I mean, I'm really surprised that they came over for the opening. Do you know? Anything? I know, yeah. Well, you know, I suppose the North was seen as a bastion of uh, loyalty, you know. So I, I don't know if they were worried about up there, even though there was a good bit of IRA activity. And in fact, more activity happens in the North, you know, after this month than does in the South. Because uh, the violence in the north does continue even kind of through the ceasefire, but I think they were so sure of having, you know, a, a well protected. I mean, there's tons of soldiers brought up there. I'm sure they were shocked, you know, that this train on the way back down to Dublin um, was was bombed. But they, I don't think that they felt they were in any danger, you know. But I mean, I have a feeling that he's the last monarch that came until Queen Elizabeth came. You know, ten or eleven years ago, whenever she came, so there, there probably was a lesson learned. You know, but I think they were pretty secure going to Belfast. Mm -hmm. Karen and Andy, were you going to ask something? Are you muted again? Yeah. <laughs> My apologies. No problem. Um, that story that you had about the uh, black and tan officer. Mm. who um, had been killed and maintained that he was innocent. Yeah. Do you think because he had been born in Dublin, that he had Irish roots, that that was a particular reason why the British said, well, he was dispensable? I was wondering about that, you know, and, and I forget, I read today the, the statistics, um, because certainly I grew up being told, you know, that it was the dregs of British prisons that came over as black and tans. But it was a, an alarmingly high statistic of Irish people were recruited as auxiliaries uh, and or black and tans. But I, I think there must have been something to it, like, you know, for sure. What did I say? There was something like 22 auxiliaries that had been in line, you know, or, or certainly on trial, but escaped the noose. So I, it's a little bit suspect, you know, that a Dublin born soldier was I think, as you say, seen as kind of dispensable. And, you know, it was a good PR exercise for them to say, no, see, we are maintaining order among the troops. Like, I, I definitely think had he been British, um, you know, maybe he would have gotten away with it. But he served in the, you know, in, in the, the British, the First World War, you know, so it, it's a tough one to call. Like, he seems to have been, for some reason, he was disposable. I mean, they protected people who went into mental homes after, you know, or, or were kind of hidden away in mental homes for a little while and then released. So it's it's an interesting choice that they do kill this man who, you know, obviously didn't have much much power or status, despite being a, a loyal British soldier, you know, for years before he joined the, the Black and Tans. So it is a bit surprising, you know, that he was Dublin born. Hmm. Now, I'm not sure that the... DJ Kelly or that historian has a blog about it. Uh, I think he's a book coming out soon. I don't know whether it was known, you know, at the time kind of thing that he was Irish born. So that would be interesting too. You know, they, they may have kind of kept that element quiet. Was he Protestant? Do you know? He was Protestant, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions or comments? Oh, I'm going to just check Facebook too. I, I see people on Facebook. Uh, so Chris and Kathy McCarthy said, thanks, Elizabeth. I'm sure you discussed it before, but adding to the UK's PR problems, I imagine the British public was exhausted. Was a full-fledged escalation by the British military a genuine political option? Yeah, it absolutely was not, I don't think, a political option. That, that's a very good point. Um, you know, they've been fighting hard World War One. They're kind of just coming back from that. The, the Treaty of Versailles, you know, has been over. The, they really have a, a mountain to climb in terms of PR and morale. Like, it, it, you know, it was one thing during World War One to kind of be fighting the Hun or, you know, that kind of thing. But when the reports are coming out like that, you know, innocent people are being killed or, or you know, houses being burnt down, that's not very chivalrous. You know, it's not a kind of army becoming conduct, you know, sort of thing. So I think from that point of view, it was very difficult to sell it to the British public for sure, you know, um, and, you know, and the empire at large is kind of watching this, like, there, you know, we know even as early as 1910, the, the Indian and Irish alliance, you know, had kind of been happening in New York and stuff. So the British have, an, in one way, the British have more to lose by going harder militarily, you know, than 
than if they sort of went softly, softly. And I, I think Lloyd George, for sure, you know, his nickname was the Welsh Wizard. He seems to have been treading this line where he was kind of, you know, talking sternly publicly. But, you know, for sure, like the fact that they have all of these feelers out since November or December of 1920, you know, goes to show you that they they really didn't have the stomach to up the violence, you know. So um, I think this this kind of attrition that the IRA are taking on them where it's small, you know, local hits, you know, you might kill eight soldiers on a, you know, I hate to use the word good, but on a good raid. You know, so th this is not a battle of the Somme happening every week or anything, but it's that attrition, you know, that kind of wore down, I think, the British desire. And then, you know, because it is a group of maybe 12 men or whatever, the, you know, the only t retaliation they can take is to go into a village and burn it down. You know, it's not... The, the morale among the forces was low, not to mind, you know, so they're writing letters home, you know, the press is there. I, I think there was just no stomach for that kind of war um, after, particularly after four years of World War One, too. Yeah, good point. Uh, anyone else have anything? No, Jack, you're good. <laughs> Let me check Facebook again. It's hard to uh, keep an eye on everything. <laughs> So, yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought I muted that. Yeah, no. Oh, was the church complicit with the North? Was the church complicit with the North? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, I mean, the Catholic Church, particularly in the North, are in a soup, you know, they're in a really minority. So the North is more complicated. And I might look at that next week in a separate or next month in a separate kind of um event because things have been heating up in in certain communities like Newry, Belfast, Derry as well you know so uh, there there's a the sectarian violence is happening much more often in the north than it was in the south even though I, you know I said today maybe some of the southern attacks on kind of locals um, even starting with Mrs Lacey we talked about her in February or March you know the, the Protestant land lady kind of that was accused of being a spy so there, there is a certain element of sectarianism creeping in in the south, but in the north, it was on a much bigger scale, you know. So um, I think the church, when they talked about the, the, the clergyman being killed, you know, a 78 year old clergyman, he probably had not done anything, you know, to, to warrant being killed. So I, I think in terms of that, they felt strongly that, you know, that shouldn't have happened. Um, but, you know, the clergy would be a target, you would imagine, too, for maybe, you know, black and tan attacks or, or auxiliary attacks. So, and, you know, the church are conflicted themselves. You've got the likes of Flanagan, who was he the deputy head of Sinn Féin, which is kind of softening as the fight goes on, willing to compromise. Other priests had excommunicated members of the IRA and other priests are giving them succor, you know. So the church are conflicted themselves, you know, not to mind um, kind of being up there in the north. But I, I assume in the north, the policy of the Catholic Church in general was to try to keep your head down, you know, and, and try and stay quiet because they were much more vulnerable up there. Uh, so, yeah, if there's no other questions, we'll uh, leave it there. So I can't remember what are we doing. Uh, we're going to be very quiet for the first two weeks of July. I'm actually going to be away for a couple of days in California with my sister and her husband and two kids. And then we're back with uh, Dr. Jack Callahan. We'll be giving a talk on uh, James Joyce and Dubliners on the, the 12th or 13th, I can't remember now, it's the Monday of July. We have a talk about Launt Thompson. It'll be brilliant. He, he was a famous sculptor born in Ireland in um, Barsanasri or one of those, you know, in the Midlands and came, worked in Albany. Some of his work is actually on display, both in the Albany Institute, but also in, in the Metropolitan in New York. And he died, God love him, in a mental home, you know, maybe the one in Poughkeepsie or somewhere. Uh, Paula says thanks. So they'll be on. My own talk will be on and we have rescheduled, don't forget, the Adirondack talk for the 26th with Brad Edmondson. So there's, there's a couple of things in July. You'll be getting the newsletter uh, next week. But um, we, we won't be doing anything, you know, the first 10 days of July. <laughs> so enjoy everyone. Uh, you know, thank God the weather is picking up. We, we had more rain and storms and everything here on Monday or Tuesday, but the, the museum stayed dry. So I was happy about that. <laughs> and uh, we're uh, good to go. So thank you for tuning in tonight and keep an eye. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> and, thank you. Uh, <laughs> you too. And, and I'll, I'll be in touch soon.
Pardon, Karen? Enjoy California. Oh, yeah, I'm looking forward um, to it. Let's hope it's not too hot. Stay home. Stay home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Have a good night.